So hi there and welcome along to this presentation on the low down on lower back pain with me, Lee Brandon. Now in this presentation, you're going to understand the incidence and effect low back pain has on the population. You're going to learn the most common causes of lower back pain. You'll understand the nine main types of spinal pathology that lead to lower back pain and you'll be aware of a control centre approach to understanding the causation of lower back pain. And you'll understand the main principles of exercise modification and programme design for clients with lower back pain. So how big is the problem of lower back pain? Well, in the United States, they spend at least $50 billion each year on lower back pain. Lower back pain is the most common cause of job-related disability. Lower back pain is the second most common neurological ailment in the United States, and only headache is more common. In the 2002 National Health Institute survey of lower back pain lasting at least one day in the previous three months was reported by 26.4% of their respondents. So lower back pain may well be on the rise, and a recent study found that the incidence of lower back pain doubled over a 14 year period, and other studies have shown very, very similar results. So it looks like lower back pain is definitely on the increase. So what are the common causes of lower back pain? Well, the most common one is lumbar strain. So lumbar strain, could be caused by a stretch or stress injury to the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments. And that can be caused by overuse, it could be misuse, or it could be caused by trauma. So overuse could be an example of someone spends all day bent over in their garden, working on their garden, that could be overuse. Misuse might well be doing exercise incorrectly. And trauma could be something like a car traffic accident, or a sporting injury, you know, someone's playing rugby or American football and they get hit hard and that could also cause that kind of injury. So any injury to the soft tissue, if it's only for a number of days or weeks, that will be considered uh, an acute injury. If the injury lasts longer than, say, three months, then that would be considered chronic or what we now tend to call persistent pain. Then you've got nerve irritation. So nerve irritation is normally caused by mechanical pressure on a nerve known as impingement and this could be caused by a bony encroachment on a nerve, it could be um, a bulging disc or it could also be uh, inflammation to the nerve itself caused by a virus such as shingles. Then you've got uh, lumbar uh, radiculopathy and that is where a disc becomes damaged and the disc bulges or herniates and that then uh, impinges onto the nerve. So what tends to happen there is, is the annulus fibrosis of the disc over time receives microtrauma and if it doesn't heal effectively then those structures begin to weaken to the point where eventually the nucleus pulposus can start to uh, move through the annulus which causes the disc to bulge and that then can then irritate the nerve and what that can do is it can cause symptoms not just locally in the lower back pain but all the way down the sciatic nerve so the pain can be down the back of the leg all the way down the back of the calf into the foot it may also um, come with numbness and also with tingling now those symptoms tend to become worse with any movement around the waist so particularly flexion forwards or side flexion away from the injured side, but also it can also be um, aggravated with rotation as well. Okay, so you've also got a bony encroachment and that can occur where one example would be you've got two vertebral bodies, they're not very stable, so during movement they're moving across each other and that can start to lay down bony tissue over time. And that bony encroachment can then create uh, a blockage or uh, a narrowing of the foramen, 
where the nerves exit from the spinal cord and that can cause symptoms all the way down that nerve channel again. Then you've got specific conditions of the bones and joints which I'm going to come on to talk about in a moment. We've also got other conditions um, such as kidney problems, pregnancy, ovary problems and tumours which can all create uh, pain in the lower back. And then also there are idiopathic conditions which basically means there's no known cause. So now I'm going to talk about the principles of spinal pathologies and in this section I'm going to help you become familiar with the terms and conditions that you may encounter with your clients. It's not intended for any kind of diagnosis or treatment so please leave this to qualified medical or healthcare professionals but if in doubt you always refer your client out. So the first condition we're going to talk about is scoliosis. Now scoliosis is an abnormal curvature in the spine, predominantly in the frontal plane, but it can also be in the sagittal plane and the transverse plane. So if you look at the slide in front of you, what you'll see on the left is a normal spine and the spinous processes all line up right above the sacrum as they should. The diagram on the right is showing an abnormal curvature to the right and what you're seeing is the segments that have the blue line between them are the um, excessive curvatures of that scoliosis but the areas that are marked in red are actually showing you where the spine is trying to compensate to try and maintain a good position of the head above and the sacrum below. Studies have shown that scoliosis occurs in around 10 to 15 percent of the population. Now what you can also have is what's called a structural scoliosis and a functional scoliosis. Simply put, a structural scoliosis is one that's pretty much fixed, whereas a functional scoliosis is one that can be corrected. So what you can see in the, in the picture here on the right where the arrow is pointing is you'll see that to the left the vertebral body has actually grown larger than the right side of that vertebral body. So that's causing the curvature in the spine. So there are a number of things that can cause the scoliosis. So first of all it can be a congenital problem. So it might be abnormal development of the spine which results in a missing portion it might be a partial formation of the vertebral body or it could be a lack of separation of the vertebrae. Most scoliosis um, that occurs early does naturally heal itself but most of the more serious cases of scoliosis tend to begin to occur in the teenage years. Now a functional scoliosis tends to be one that's caused by perhaps a leg length discrepancy or a muscle imbalance or it could well be an atlas subluxation and these can tend to be treated very well with good corrective exercise. So the postural effects on scoliosis as you can see there in the diagram is that what you'll tend to see is not only the curvature of the spine but you'll also see that the pelvis is uh, slanted so you have one iliac crest higher than the other. You also see that you will have one shoulder higher than the other. Another thing that you'll tend to see with a structural scoliosis as the person bends forwards, if you look from behind, not only will the curvature of the spine remain, but you'll also tend to see a hump on one side of the rib cage. Now if someone has a functional scoliosis, as they bend forwards, the curvature will actually disappear. So that's a good way to know whether you can correct that with your corrective exercise or not. So the next thing to look at is a degenerative disc. So between each of the vertebral bodies you have a disc and when we're young and we're healthy it has a nice good height to the disc so it really cushions um, loads very well but as we age the amount of water in the disc and the amount of protein in the disc slowly reduces so 
people that tend to suffer from degenerative disc disease tend to be the older people. So as the disc de degenerates, it becomes less robust and it's more likely to become injured with movement and with exercise. The next thing to look at is a herniated nucleus pulposus. So as I mentioned earlier, the disc on the outside has, has an annulus and on the, in the middle it has a nucleus. And if you imagine a disc a little bit like uh, a jam donut or as you would say in America, a jelly donut, if you were to put pressure on the front of the donut, the jam is going to get pushed posteriorly or backwards. And that's pretty much what happens with the discs. So if someone is creating microtrauma to a disc, over time the disc will start to degenerate and it will de tend to degenerate in one direction. So most degeneration will either happen on the left or the right or at least more on one side than the other. Now as the degeneration increases then eventually the disc will prolapse and the disc will start to bulge and may encroach on the nerves surrounding the disc. Now when it's at that level it's probably not going to cause any major issue and it certainly won't be a condition that's considered for surgery. If the condition continues and it gets worse then eventually what you might have is a complete um, extrusion of the nucleus and then the symptoms will become much more severe so again this is where you might get not just local pain but you'll get that sciatic pain so pain numbness and tingling all down that sciatic channel on the side that tends to be injured and it tends to be on one side that you get the symptoms so the next thing to look at is degenerative uh, disease and in particular the facet joints so remember that you have a vertebral body and at the back of the vertebral bodies you have facet joints so what tends to happen again if there's excessive forces going through the facet joints and this often happens with people that have an excessive lumbar lordosis then what will happen is that you'll get wear and tear on those joints and that's what we call osteoarthritis or facet joint disease and you'll get localized pain in the area and you might also get hypertrophy of those joints and this can often be indicated um, by an x-ray so pain might be felt down the center of the lower back and can spread into both buttocks sometimes the pain may may spread into the thighs but generally it doesn't go beyond the knees. The next thing to look at is osteophytes or bone spurs. So there might also be a hypertrophy of the vertebral bodies adjacent to the degenerative um, disc and these bony overgrowths are known as osteophytes or bone spurs. So it can often occur in conjunction with facet joint pain and the arthritis can cause bone spurs at the edges of the facet joints. So these bone spurs may form in the opening where the nerve root leaves the spinal canal. So this opening is called the neural foramina. So if the bone spurs rub against the nerve root, the nerve may become inflamed and irritated. This nerve can cause symptoms where the nerve travels, and these symptoms may include again numbness, tingling, slowed reflexes or even weakened muscles. Next we have spinal stenosis. So stenosis just means blockage. Now a central stenosis is a narrowing of the spinal canal, whereas a foraminal stenosis is a narrowing of the foramen resulting in pressure on the nerve root exiting at that level. So any condition that results in movement of the bony vertebra of the spine can limit the space for the adjacent spinal cord and nerves. So causes of the bony encroachment can include spondylolisthesis, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, and again that can cause spinal nerve compression and again can lead to sciatic pain that radiates down into the extremities. 
So spinal stenosis at any level of the spine, or can occur at any level of the spine, but it's most common in the lumbar spine. Symptoms can depend on the area that's affected. Now the most common type is a degenerative stenosis. And this occurs in virtually the entire adult population as a result of aging. It's a degenerative narrowing of the spinal canal. Nerve root canals and or inter intervertebral uh, foramen. And it's caused by bone and or ligament hypertrophy in local, segmental or generalised regions. The narrowing results in compression of spinal nerves and nerve roots causing a constellation of symptoms, including lower back pain, neurogenic claudication, and lower extremity pain. A congenital lumbar stenosis is relatively rare and usually presents at an early age, often between 30 and 40 years old. Acquired lumbar um, spinal stenosis is more common and generally develops when patients are in their 60s and older. So treatment of these conditions uh, from rest to surgical decompression by removal of the bone that's compressing on the neural tissue. Next we have spondylolysis and spondylolysis is a fracture that occurs to the pars articularis of the spine. Generally speaking it occurs lower down in the lumbar spine, particularly at L5. It occurs in around 3 to 6 percent of the population and it's typically caused by a stress fracture. So what happens is in particular people that go into excessive uh, extension, so people like tennis players, cricketers and many other sports that use a lot of extension, over time those facet joints are colliding if you like and the stress that goes through the pars articularis eventually starts to become fractured. Next we have spondylolisthesis and a spondylolisthesis is most commonly caused by a spondylolysis which we have just spoken about. So what a spondylolysis is is actually an anterior slippage of one vertebra compared to the one above and below. Now the way that the spondylolysis causes that is because you start off with a fracture to the pars articularis and then eventually once it breaks completely through now the vertebral bodies have got nothing holding themselves together and that's what causes the slippage forwards. And you also have a retrolysthesis where you actually have a posterior slippage of the vertebra compared to the one above and below. The condition can produce an excessive lumbar lordosis but over time it tends to become a flat lumbar spine and generally comes with um, pain locally in the area, muscle tightness particularly in the hamstrings, pain in the buttocks and thighs, general stiffness and tenderness in the area and potentially also nerve damage from the pressure of the nerve roots and that may cause radiating pain down the legs. Next we have ankylosing spondylitis and this is a form of arthritis that primarily affects the spine although other joints can become involved. The hallmark feature of ankylosing spondylitis is the involvement of the sacroiliac joints during the progression of the disease. In advanced cases the inflammation can lead to new uh, bone formation on the spine causing the spine to fuse in a fixed immobile position sometimes causing quite a forward stooped posture. So exercise is a real integral part of any spondyli spondylitis management program. It's also believed that the bacteria Klebsiella also plays a role in the cause of ankylosing spondylitis in some cases. But it's not always about the back. So you can have back pain, but it might not be the back that actually needs to be treated.